with the Green Bomb Pledge. Uh, the pledge is a joint initiative that was developed and designed by international climate finance and environmental groups, including the Climate Bonds Initiative, Mission 2020, CDP, Series, who's taking a, a very leadership role in all of this, including um, within the Global Climate Action Summit, Citizens Climate Lobby, California Governor's Office, California Treasurer's Office, Global Optimism, NRDC, and the Climate Group, just to give you a sense of all the different uh, organizations who are very active in this space have come together uh, to put in place this pledge and launch it. It is a simple declaration with a broad and far-reaching impact. So for issuers, as you see there to your left-hand column, it is to commit to incorporate resilience and mitigation into infrastructure and other capital projects. It is very important to note that uh, we have to think differently in the way in which we are building out our infrastructure now and into the future. This is about future development. It's about keeping competitively, uh, not only locally within local markets, but also um, uh, internationally uh, as the world is moving uh, towards a low carbon economy. It is important that we also take into account um, the resilience component and ensuring that our infrastructure is able to sustain, which I'm afraid to say, the already locked in uh, warming that we already have. Um, it is a degree that all infrastructure and capital projects will need to be climate resilient and, where relevant, support the reduction of GHG emissions. It is to welcome the role that green bonds can play in helping to achieve the financing of that infrastructure. It is to support the rapid growth of a green bonds market, and it is to pledge to establish a green bonds strategy. This is very much about showing the commitment at state level, at city level, at public sector institution level on the commitment to address the challenges of climate change, financially responsible in making sure that um, uh, these things can be addressed properly. And so the Green Bomb Pledge is, is one way of being able to take action. It is a way of being vocal and making presence the commitment uh, on this agenda, and most importantly, creating that space for investors to recognize uh, the issuers that are committed to this and where there may be potential investment opportunities for them in this space. For the investor, it is to sign an investor statement supporting the pledge and investments in a low-carbon economy. It is to recognize that the growth of the international green bonds market provides a useful mechanism to finance solutions to climate change. Believe that green bonds and other green asset classes represent an investment opportunity and to support the continued development of this market. What I will say is that the green, um, the investment community has been quite vocal, and in the last few years, um, there have been global investor statements, um, many of which series has led on, uh, which has captured the institutional investor base globally on their commitment uh, to investing in this space. Uh, close to 60 trillion of assets under management, uh, which is a plethora of sovereign wealth, of pension funds, uh, and insurance industry bodies. Uh, all committed and recognizing the need uh, for this market, which explains why you've seen $3 billion to over $400 billion in such a short period of time, uh, with a target of $1 trillion by 2020. So we can draw in the, you know, the American pledge, the We Are Still In campaign uh, has very much been driving uh, this agenda in the U.S. Um, and, of course, here we've got a quote from uh, the Prime Minister of Fiji at the last COP. We can draw from the power and enthusiasm of local and regional leaders in the mission to tackle climate change. So many of you have already demonstrated how to make decisions and implement them. So I finished with this uh, to open it up for questions. Um, I would like to say that uh, the two people that have really helped to support and drive this agenda for Peter Ellsworth from Ceres um, and Michael Paparian at the Climate Bonds Initiative, uh, California State Representative, um, who can help you with um, any addition to questions and um, comments that you may have on this uh, following this webinar. Uh, you can contact uh, Michael Paparian at climatebonds.net. Um, this, of course, has been a consorted effort 
uh, with many uh, key institutions and partners. So now uh, what I'd like to do is turn it over to questions. Thank you, Justine. So the first question we've had come in is from David Woolley, UC Berkeley Goldman School. He's asked, in regard to the investor pledge, is there a minimum amount or a percentage of investment required in order to be listed as having made, made the pledge? So what it sounds like is, is there a, a level of AUM that is required in order to sign up? Um, or actually, if you've had a percentage of actually investing in green, either way, uh, no. Uh, it simply comes down to most of this has been targeting the institutional investor base, I will say. Um, again, sovereign wealth, pension funds, insurance industry, and very much committed to uh, shifting their investments in the direction of uh, green, keeping it more general um, within the sustainable finance uh, arena. And so that has, uh, like I said, been a an conglomerate effort of AUM in total uh, around 60 uh, trillion of assets under management. The next question we've had come in is, do green bonds have to be certified? That's a very good question. Uh, I would say that um, it is quite critical and very much encouraged. Best practice is to have a independent review that could either come in the form of a second party opinion, uh, which would be a second party opinion provider. Uh, some of those familiar names would be Sustainalytics, the JO, True Cost, and others uh, that can provide that. And that's an independent review of the portfolio um, and then, of course, there is the certification option, which follows a third-party verification, which means a standard is required of which the portfolio is assessed against the standard, and that third-party verifier provides that certification. Um, of course, we've had SPO providers being able to do that as much as we've had the big four, like PwC, KPMG, and EY, and others providing that. Self-declared bonds um, are not encouraged. Uh, a lot of what investors want to see is that there's a lot of transparency and disclosure around the use of proceeds, the commitment to the reporting. All of this is captured in the independent review. Uh, and so investors uh, tend to favor those with, um, uh, with that level of transparency and making sure that they're following with the best practices. Green bond principles. Uh, is, let's say, the market entry point for an issuer. I highly encourage anyone to, uh, who is not familiar with those to look at those who are of interest, and that will give you a sense of the requirements for labeling. On the back of that is standards and certification scheme of which uh, Climate Bonds Initiative provides the international community. Thank you for that, Justine. The next question we've just had come in is which companies or issuers have signed the Green Bond, bond Pledge so far? That is a very good question. Um, there is a number of uh, state public sector uh, entities that are, have been um, vocalizing their desire to sign up. I don't know, Mike, if you want to give us a rundown of who you have on your list to date. Yeah, hi, Justine. This is Mike Paparian. Um, uh, we we have several uh, in process. Uh, Peter Ellsworth from Series has been in contact with a few who are on the verge of signing. Uh, but we do have uh, a couple of companies uh, in several states. Uh, California is poised to sign. There hasn't been a public announcement yet, but there will be uh, in early August. Rhode Island uh, is uh, ready to sign. Um, uh, and then we have a um, uh, global new energy finance uh, company from uh, uh, Europe working on uh, energy efficiency and other financing. So we have several either in process or that have signed already. And I'd also like to mention other discussions have been with MTA and SFPUC. Um, much of the existing issuer base uh, are looking to sign the pledge and lead up to making those announcements at the summit in September. Thank you both for answering that. The next question we've just had come in is, do you have an example of a public green bond strategy 
for local government issuers to reference as a best practice? That is a very good question, and I'd like to revert back to um, the resource that uh, Katie Walsh had highlighted in her presentation, uh, which is the, uh, let's call it a how-to manual for cities on how to issue green bonds, label green bonds, uh, that's one. Two is the public sector guide, uh, global public sector guide that CBI, World Bank, UNIP Inquiry, and others came together to publish, which is the role of uh, public sector in helping to leverage the green bond market. And in that, it captures um, what uh, green bond strategies um, public sector issuers can take. Uh, and, of course, other things that are in development that we will be making available is the experience that we've had directly with sovereigns on the process of issuance. Uh, and from that, the identifying of seven to ten year infrastructure pipeline investments uh, for green bonds. I'll mention that um, liaising with investors, given CBI is a investor-focused organization and does spend a lot of time uh, engaging with our investor base that are buying green bonds, something that they have uh, grown to greatly appreciate uh, is when issuers are building out green bond programs rather than coming to market as a one-off. Uh, a lot of it is the issue of premium, of course, from a cost perspective. It's much more um, uh, cost-effective for them uh, if they know that there's going to be more than one issuance coming out of an issuer. So seeing these green bond programs, which uh, have been coming to light in the last, uh, I'd say, 15 to 18 months, quite several uh, issuers who have done this. So that's also another aspect to mention. Uh, then, of course, finally, in its early infancy, has been around capital raising plans at local government level, um, where we are working on this um, mainly in the emerging market space, uh, and this is something that we can take offline, and I'm happy to elaborate more on. And this is Katie. I would just add that um, in the Green City Bonds playbook, the two examples that I think are really interesting, um, I mean, that are highlighted, but, you know, if you, if you again want to reach out to the city and talk with them, is the city of St. Paul that issued a green bond and the city of Asheville. So I think depending on who's asking the question, you know, there's a lot that you can learn from these direct conversations as well. And if that's something you're interested in, we can help facilitate, CDP can help facilitate, so just let us know. Brilliant. Thanks, Katie. The so next question is someone's asked, if I had to propose green bonds to my CFO in a municipality, what would you say are the key benefits over other bonds or financing methods? All right, so that is a question that not only do I get quite a bit, but also when I'm sitting in front of CFOs and they're asking me, why would we want to do this? And I'll say that really quite frankly, at least let's speak globally now, um, the benefits have gone beyond just the traditional investor diversification, the branding exercise of it, the leadership side of it, um, because as I said, we are now beginning to see a price advantage taking place, and we start began to see this around three to three hundred and fifty billion U.S. dollars, and that's the analysis uh, that uh, CBI has been doing now over the course of the last year, and so those reports you can find online. Um, but within the U.S. market, it's very much driven uh, by investor for, excuse me, investor diversification. And I'll give you an example of the uh, state of Massachusetts was perfect for this. Um, issuing bonds all the time, um, but never able to truly attract the high quality investor base that, uh, uh, through the regular bond financing. And decided, all right, well, let's, you know, do a green bond for many other factors. They wanted to um, uh, use this as a, a marketing exercise. And within that first green bond, they ended up picking up a lot of the target investors they hadn't accessed before, one of those being TIAA. Uh, and so they've now been a repeat issuer uh, because not only have they kept those quality investors. They've also managed to continue to pick up new investors every time. And then going back to the example is at SFPUC, who's not only been quite successful in bringing new investors uh, domestically, but also now moving into the international space. 
um, and trying to tap European buyers. So it is an interesting dynamic. I would say that that would be the key driver. And, of course, with demand being as high as it is uh, internationally, um, it goes without saying that uh, CFOs, at least 80 to 90 percent of them that revert back to me after they issue, always say that that was the best thing that they could have done. And, of course, uh, you know, outside of the engagement uh, of convincing a CFO, I'd also say that the benefits that come off of it is an incredible uh, education exercise. Uh, it is a chance to engage internally with siloed divisions, uh, particularly in government-type public sector settings, uh, of which then now teams are talking and understanding exactly what they could be doing. In other words, if you are sitting on a portfolio of, an, uh, of assets that you never knew could actually qualify, you've now got a new source of capital that you can access uh, to finance those. And um, we've seen that uh, time and time again. Thanks, Justine. So the next question we've had come in is how how can you determine what is green, i.e. green bond funded projects, and how do you avoid that a project financed with a green bond has a negative impact on the environment? Very good question. Um, let me say that there has been extensive work on defining what is green uh, since the evolution of this market, um, starting with uh, surveying the existing proxy in the landscape of work that had already been done by multilateral development banks, scientific institutions, uh, NGOs, uh, and other similar international uh, type bodies. Um, climate Bonds Initiative uh, put in place an international climate bond standard certification scheme. Green Bond Principles came in with their voluntary principles. Uh, a process which is very much focused on uh, ways in which you are managing and reporting on proceeds and making project selection um, beyond their bucket list categories of what is considered eligible. On the back of that is then resources of um, taxonomies uh, that have been developing globally. So uh, the CBI taxonomy is extensive in the fact that it, it works across all the major sectors and identifies the key investments uh, needed to shift uh, in climate change. And it takes in technical working groups, it takes in uh, industry working groups, and pulls them together uh, through an extensive process of analysis and determinant of uh, what are the key investments and to ensure impact. We've also seen coming out of that, uh, you know, China setting up their own green definitional work, connecting that very closely to the developments that have happened in the EU. The EU is in the process now of developing an EU-wide sustainability taxonomy, a green definitional work, um, which has been a collaborative effort uh, where CBI and others have been involved. And so I guess the good news is, is there's quite a bit to work with, uh, a lot of options um, on determining what is green. I think that the impact side of it is uh, still developing, uh, making sure that we are reporting uh, properly on the appropriate metrics uh, and ensuring that impact is actually getting delivered. And also understanding what we expect out of certain assets. Uh, in other words, do we need to have a carbon footprint analysis of wind farms? or are they just straight in eligible assets? And the fact that they exist and the proceeds are being managed accordingly is enough. So these are complex questions that are currently being uh, debated internationally. Thank you, Justine. So the next one that's just come in is how does the pledge relate to the international climate agenda and will it be featured at the COP24 in Poland? Mike, let me turn that over to you and give you a chance to, to chime in on that. Um, so the, um, the international community has been starting to focus uh, on finance and finance solutions uh, as part of the overall uh, agenda to address climate change. So um, I think there's an increasing recognition that uh, to the extent that projects are financed with bonds, they ought to be green bonds, and that the infrastructure that we build from now forward 
should be uh, really uh, built in recognition of uh, climate problems and climate solutions um, and not uh, be built in the traditional way of uh, not taking into account uh, climate impacts. So I think what the, what the green bond um, effort to do is help identify uh, those components of infrastructure projects which, which need to be um, um, improved in order to uh, qualify as green bonds and then uh, be built in a way that's consistent with what we need going forward. In terms of COP24, uh, my understanding is that um, uh, green finance and green bonds will be featured heavily, uh, and um, uh, the side events for that haven't been uh, put together yet, but uh, I know there will be several efforts to feature uh, green bonds and the green bond pledge, particularly uh, at the uh, subnational uh, activities that will be going on in association with COP24 in Poland. Uh, I know that CBI will be having a presence there, and I know uh, Ceres has had uh, a major presence in the past. CDP has always been there. Uh, a number of the subnational groups that have been involved in the um, development of the Green Bond Pledge will be there and will be um, uh, both making presentations and serving as resources on Green Bonds and the Green Bond Pledge. Thanks, Mike. I think it's also important to note uh, for any um, uh, participants on today's webinar who is interested in the Green Bond Pledge and signing that, um, it's quite a straightforward, simple process. Uh, visit the website uh, as we have uh, here on the screen, uh, and that will take you to the page where uh, you will have a backstory of what the Green Bond Pledge is, how it came about, who's involved, uh, and then uh, an option to sign the pledge. So it's quite straightforward giving in your details. So I thought that's important uh, to mention as well. Katie, is there anything that you wanted to add uh, to that following Mike? The other thing I would just add is that if you're not aware, if you are a municipality, there are several challenges that are being announced in relation to the Global Climate Action Summit. So the Green Bond Challenge is is one opportunity for your city. There are several others. Um, and so CDP has facilitated some of those discussions. You can also make a zero energy buildings commitment. You can also look towards, um, if, overall, if you look at the Global Climate Action Summit page, there's some further information for cities. So again, use us as a resource if you want. And then in particular, if you want to start exploring the conversation on a Green Bond Pledge, commitment for GCAS, um, working here now with the Climate Bonds team is the, is the way to do it. Thank you, Katie. Um, so the next question we've just had come in is, are green bonds commonly used to raise finance for more purposes than just project finance? In other words, indirect expenditures for subsidies encouraging renewable energy uptake? Good question. Uh, can't say that we have necessarily seen that to date, unless uh, Katie or Mike, uh, you have, and I'm not aware. But um, what I can say is that most of what we have seen is refinancing. I mean, we do have to actually understand the role of bonds full stop, no matter what label you're putting on it. Uh, it functions uh, primarily as a refinancing tool uh, in the sense that institutional investors do not like to take on project finance risk. Uh, so much of this would be, let's say, an existing uh, wind farm or solar farm that's being repackaged and uh, sold off to the investors, while that, in theory, would be freeing up uh, for project finance for additional wind farm developments. Of course, we have seen a mix of new and refi, and much of that has been just the extension of um, uh, existing projects and building out new into new locations. Um, so, uh, I think in terms of other areas of investments that might be considered soft investments, um, we have seen some R&D um, bits that we have seen some funds set up separately uh, to help support green, local green bond market growth in terms of uh, subsidizing verification costs. We've seen this in Singapore where a fund was set up specifically for that purpose for issuers that want to avoid uh, additional costings. However, having said that, it is also important to note 
that the costs of, of the verification are minimal in comparison uh, to what is actually coming out in terms of the co-benefits and, um, and the issuance itself and process. Um, verifier fees can run anywhere from you know ten to thirty thousand US dollars, and that's paying for the verifier to come in and do the assessment. Um, it all depends also on the starting point of the issuer internally, how their internal operations and systems are in place, uh, because of course coming back to the need to uh, report on those proceeds annually up to the life term of the bond, you know, is is a, a cost in itself. Uh, but again, it does come down to the starting point of the issuer. There's much of like there's a CSR program in place already, and we're simply leveraging those existing mechanics uh, in place. So a long-winded answer to your question, um, but I will say that um, it's limited in bond financing in those types of investments. Thank you, Justine. And the next question that we've had come in is. Does the pledge mean, does having made the pledge mean I have to issue all of my bonds as green bonds? I would say absolutely not. I think what the pledge is actually encouraging is for issuers to refocus in the way that they are financing in the long term. And so where there is an opportunity to uh, issue green bonds, in let's say, right, we are a locality that wants to put in uh, an extension of public mass transit systems. We want to be able to expand across uh, our ability to uh, urban mobility. Uh, and in combination to that, we want to have um, some energy efficiency upgrades and components, um, creating efficiency within the living environment and also uh, parks and things, the whole package that comes out of that. We need to start thinking. Uh, about how we better build our cities, and you know, green bonds are very much encouraging that shift in thinking. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, probably what we would be uh, saying we need to stop uh, or do less of is high carbon intensive infrastructure development, um, because unfortunately we do not have the luxury. Uh, of, of building out our cities in this manner anymore in light of uh, the challenges that we are already uh, impacted with. Thank you, Justine. And the next question that has come in is, um, can I sign as an individual mayor or CEO, et cetera? Just sort of going back to that uh, previous question, I think uh, it's important and um, getting a note from Peter Ellsworth. Uh, that I'd like to highlight, that uh, the pledge is a way to publicly acknowledge that future infrastructure and capital projects will fully account for climate change and climate risks. So there is no obligation to actually issue a green bond. There is a bigger underlying message here. Great. Thank you for clearing that up, Justine. And uh, so back to the question asked before, can I sign as an individual mayor or CEO, et cetera? Of course, um, that's 100% uh, uh, encouraged and uh, eligible. Okay, and uh, let the next question we've had come in is, how does the pledge relate to the Global Climate Action Summit? I think we've already answered that one, actually, so... Um Justine, maybe I'll just jump in real quickly on that, and, and that is that it, uh, the, the Action Summit, uh, the, the main word uh, that they're focusing on is action, and there's a series of actions that uh, are going to be taken uh, in a variety of areas by subnational uh, governments leading up to the summit and after the summit. This is one of the key finance-related actions that uh, local governments are being called on to take ahead of the summit and will be called on at the summit to uh, uh, take after the summit to the extent they haven't already done so. Uh, there are other uh, finance and investment related uh, commitments that Ceres and others are working on, uh, but this is really uh, one of the key ones in the finance area. Excellent, thanks Mike for that. Okay. So that's all the questions that we've had 
for today coming in. So I think that takes us on to finishing things up. Justine. Thank you, Chris. So, yes, as I said, um, uh, if there are no more questions, we will draw this webinar to a close. Uh, before we go, please do check out the Green Bomb Pledge at www.greenbombpledge.com. Uh, and if you have any more questions, uh, please contact Mike Paparian at clientbonds.net. Uh, do look and watch out for this space. Uh, we are quite excited and laid up uh, to September uh, as we build momentum around this initiative. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I hope you have a good afternoon, good morning, or good evening wherever you are in the world. Thank you.